right, folks. It's good to be here this morning. We'll get back in our lesson today. We'll pick up on the uh, Antichrist. Where we're headed. All right. I couldn't find a recording instrument, so I had to use this laptop computer. You're going to hear the voices of two presidents that have uh, uh, passed on. One is President Eisenhower, the other is President John F. Kennedy. And I'm going to let you hear them just a moment. Before we do, let's pray. Father, give me wisdom now, Lord. Give me the understanding that I'll need our Heavenly Father and the gift of teaching. And then, Father, give the folks ears to hear. Let them receive what we say, not as it is the word of man, but as it is the word of God. Not my word, but thy word. And, Father, give me the sense and the wisdom to convey it. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, Revelation 13. You must know that this is so very important. Because it says in verse 16, He causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. And his number is six hundred, threescore and six. Two thousand years ago, when this book of Revelation was written by the Apostle John. There is no humanly possible way that he could have known what was going to happen 2,000 years in the future. That's utterly impossible. People don't even know what's going to happen tomorrow. And yet 2,000 years into the future, the book of Revelation is more alive now than it's ever been. And it should be to you folks that are aware of the world that you live in because events are transpiring so quickly now, things are happening so quickly that you've got to be brought abreast of what's going on. We talked to you last week about the RFID chip that's being placed, used for identification. It's a radio frequency ID. The uh, sinister part about this chip is the fact that it can be turned on or off. If it is implanted in a human being, it scans you scans the information that's pertinent to you, that they want to keep in some main database in the, in the uh, government, and they can identify you. The Bible says that the time is going to come when no man can buy or sell except, except he have the mark of the beast. Amen. So therefore, this beast, this Antichrist, must be able to control commerce. And of course he will. And uh, we are so globally interconnected today that it literally blow your mind. Uh, uh, Tuesday, the states of Ohio and Texas will have their primaries for uh, Democratic primaries for uh, president. And while they were in the state of Ohio just a few days ago, and are still there, as a matter of fact, this afternoon, both uh, Democratic candidates will be speaking in high schools in Ohio. Uh, they made this statement, uh, the camp of Obama did, that 200,000 people have lost their jobs in Ohio. We're not talking about hamburger flipping jobs. We're talking about manufacturing jobs. We're talking about the kind of job a man needs to support his family, to make a decent income. 200,000 jobs just in the state of Ohio. Why? NAFTA. Amen. 20 years ago, Ross Perot told him, said, if you pass NAFTA, which Bill Clinton signed into law, if you pass NAFTA, it will, you'll hear a giant sucking sound as the jobs go south. And they have. Right. Exactly as Ross Perot said, it's happened. So 200,000 people in Ohio, they call it the Rust Belt. Uh, areas in Michigan, Ohio, and what used to be the industrial north were the major manufacturing plants of steel and then automotive manufacturing and so forth were located. Now it's the Rust Belt. These people are looking for jobs. It's a shame, isn't it? that this has happened uh, to the country. Now, uh, when one uh, presidential candidate was questioned about his policy on economics, he said, well, my concern's more about foreign policy. In plain words, he doesn't have a clue and doesn't care. If you can't buy a gallon of gasoline, a, a, a gallon of milk, 
Uh, if you can't make your, your house payment, if you can't get a decent job, it doesn't matter to him because he's part of the elite. And that's who we'll talk about this morning when we get into it. The CFR, the Council on Foreign Relations, and what's really going on in this country. A conspiracy. Does a conspiracy exist? I heard something yesterday that I never heard in my life. These are the words of President John Fitzgerald Kennedy spoken over 40 years ago. And I want you to just hear what this man had to say. It's about five minutes long. And uh, you can hear what the president had to say. All right, here we go. Ladies and gentlemen, the very word secrecy is repugnant in a free and open society. And we are, as a people, can you hear that? and historically opposed to secret societies, to secret oaths, and to secret proceedings. We decided long ago that the dangers of excessive and unwarranted concealment of pertinent facts far outweigh the dangers which are cited to justify it. Even today, there is little value in opposing the threat of a closed society by imitating its arbitrary restrictions. Even today, there is little value in ensuring the survival of our nation if our traditions do not survive with it. And there is very grave danger that an announced need for increased security will be seized upon by those anxious to expand its meaning to the very limits of official censorship and concealment. That I do not intend to permit to the extent that it's in my control. And no official of my administration, whether his rank is high or low, civilian or military, should interpret my words here tonight as an excuse to censor the news, to stifle dissent, to cover up our mistakes, or to withhold from the press and the public the facts they deserve to know. For we are opposed around the world by a monolithic and ruthless conspiracy that relies primarily on covet means for expanding its sphere of influence, on infiltration instead of invasion, on subversion instead of elections, on intimidation instead of free choice, on guerrillas by night instead of armies by day. It is a system which has conscripted vast human and material resources into the building of a tightly knit highly efficient machine that combines military, diplomatic, intelligent, economic, scientific, and political operations. Its preparations are concealed, not published. Its mistakes are buried, not headlined. Its dissenters are silenced, not praised. No expenditure is questioned, no rumor is printed, no secret is revealed. No president should fear public scrutiny of this program, for from that scrutiny comes understanding, and from that understanding comes support or opposition, and both are necessary. I am not asking your newspapers to support an administration, but I am asking your help in the tremendous task of informing and alerting the American people. For I have complete confidence. and the response and dedication of our citizens whenever they are fully informed. I not only could not stifle controversy among your readers, I welcome it. This administration intends to be candid about its errors. For as a wise man once said, an error doesn't become a mistake until you refuse to correct it. We intend to accept full responsibility for our errors, and we expect you to point them out when we miss them. Without debate, Without criticism, no administration and no country can succeed, and no republic can survive. That is why the Athenian lawmaker Sola decreed a crime for any citizen to shrink from controversy. And that is why our press was protected by the First Amendment, the only business in America specifically protected by the Constitution, not primarily to amuse and entertain, not to emphasize the trivial and the sentimental, not to simply give the public what it wants, but to inform, to arouse, to reflect, 
to state our dangers and our opportunities, to indicate our crises and our choices, to lead, mold, educate, and sometimes even anger public opinion. This means greater coverage and analysis of international news, for it is no longer far away and foreign, but close at hand and local. It means greater attention to improved understanding of the news, as well as improved transmission. And it means, finally, that government at all levels must meet its obligation to provide you with the fullest possible information outside the narrowest limits of national security. And so it is to the printing press, to the recorder of man's deeds, the keeper of his conscience, the courier of his news, that we look for strength and assistance, confidence that with your help, man will be what he was born to be, free and independent. John F. Kennedy didn't live long after he said that. He was assassinated in Dallas, Texas, and uh, the assassination of uh, John F. Kennedy was uh, blamed on Lee Harvey Oswald, who was himself assassinated within 24 hours or so by Jack Ruby. And uh, to this day, uh, most of the American people believe that a conspiracy was involved in the death of uh, the president. And uh, there's a lot of information available. If you like to get into all that, that's not what it's about this morning, about that. But the fact is, I personally believe, from what I've read, what I've seen, witnessed, observed in the media and so forth, that there was a conspiracy, that uh, John Kennedy was, uh, was executed. He was uh, assassinated because this right here tells me, if this man believed what he said about a conspiracy, and he believed in the sovereignty of this country, he believed in a free and open society, he said that... He welcomed uh, controversy and opposition and uh, debate and so forth, which is good for an open society. Uh, these are the principles that the government's built upon. Then he is in no way part of the New World Order because the New World Order is a secretive society, a shadow government that's working in the background. In plain words, what you see is not what you get. What you hear is not the truth. It's all filtered, spun, and then given out, dished out to you as you'd feed a baby. Uh, you're not allowed to research for yourself. This is why they hate the Internet. The reason they hate the Internet is because the Internet has become a vehicle to uh, disseminate large amounts of information that wasn't available to the people before. And if you're looking for information, you jump in that ocean of the Internet and you'll swim forever. Believe me, it has, it has all the information you want. If you want the truth, you can find the truth. The truth is there. Uh, let me play for just a, so a short segment of what Dwight David Eisenhower had to say when he left office. When he was about, this 1960, I think, he said uh, uh, middle of this century and uh, plus a decade. The total influence, economic, political, even spiritual, is felt in every city, every state house, every office of the federal government. We recognize the imperative need for this development. Yet we must not fail to comprehend its grave implications. Our toil, resources, and livelihood are all involved. So is the very structure of our society. In the councils of government, we must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The potential for the disastrous rise of misplaced power exists and will persist. We must never let the weight of this combination endanger our liberty or democratic process. We should take nothing for granted. Only an alert and knowledgeable citizen can compel the proper meshing of the huge industrial and military machinery of defense with our peaceful methods and goals. All right, now let me bring you up to date on what he's talking about here. Let's stop it here. Uh, when uh, President Eisenhower was leaving office, he made that speech in reference to the fact that because of World War II, the United States would never be the same, that uh, the machinery in this country, uh, the industrial complex of this country, the, the manufacturing of war machines had established a, a, uh, a, uh, a form of, uh, 
I don't know how, what the best word to use for it. He called it a complex. It had established in this country a formidable power because they, they manufactured so many weapons. And, and they had to do that because of World War II. And he said that, of course, was necessary. And he said it's necessary to have a strong military to defend your country and defend freedom. These are the words of uh, President Eisenhower. If you'd like to have the, the full speech, I can show you where to find that. But uh, uh, he said, but it has also, I want to give you some warnings about this, that this complex that has been created must perpetuate itself. That's the idea. It's an industrial military complex that must continue on. In other words, uh, when you raise a huge army, you're either going to have to go to war or disband your army. You can't feed an army just to have a big army. You have to have a reason for that army, unless, of course, it's defensive. So this is the idea with the complex, all right, the great industrial military complex. Well, uh, for example, right now in Iraq, there's a huge military industrial complex called Halliburton. And these people are making a pile of money off of uh, what's happening in Iraq, you see. Well, somebody has to manufacture the weapons. Somebody has to be involved in this, that, and so forth. This is not to demonize Halliburton, but it's simply to bring you abreast with what's going on. Somebody has to make the weapons of war. By making the weapons of war, somebody's making money. All right. That's just a fact of life. All right. Now, once a person begins to make money, and, uh, for example, Exxon Mobil's making a pile of money, so is Shell, so is Texaco, and the rest of them, once you get a taste of these big mega bucks, it's hard to push yourself away from the table. So then you begin, you begin to influence government and influence government uh, decisions and policy and so forth. And that's what's happening. And uh, this is only a small part of the overall picture of this great global conspiracy, and we're going to talk about it now, that we're looking at. There is no question that there are people who want war. They want war because war is profitable. And uh, the Rothschild family in Europe financed the wars of Europe on both sides. Yeah. Finance both sides because war is profitable. Everything heats up in war. And if perchance we did go into a third world war, and I'm talking about a third world war where we've got nations involved like we did in World War II, then you'd see the economy of America heat up like you can imagine. And some of you lived through World War II and understand what I'm talking about. Everything speeds up at a time of war. And uh, policies are, are, are drafted that deal with the war issue because that becomes the number one issue. Well, right now in this, in this presidential campaign, uh, it started out about the war. The debate last year was about the war in Iraq. It's not about the war in Iraq anymore. The, the, the debate in the presidential election now is about the economy. And the, why is it about the economy? Because people are losing their jobs. People can't afford. They're already telling you right now your food's going to double in price. In some places 50%, some places 100%. The gasoline may go well over $4 a gallon this summer. And, and diesel fuel, it runs an average of 50 to 75 cents more a gallon than gasoline does. Now, where did people get the money for this? How do you pay for that? How, how can you afford this, this kind of thing? So somebody is manipulating at a, at a, at a pretty high level the housing market. An economist that, that's worth half his wages would not have known 10 years ago that this housing bubble would bust one day, that you cannot overinflate the value of something and it doesn't have the real market value. You can't overinflate. The day will come when it will bust, when people will say, hold on, I'm not going to pay that much for it or... They cut the money supply off, and it worked both directions. And so the housing market is pulling a lot of other things down. The U.S. economy right now is, on, uh, is, is, is not real stable because of a lot of factors being involved. The dollar is dropping in Europe uh, because the value of the dollar at home is dropping. So therefore, as it relates to the euro, it drops. As it relates to the Canadian pound, it drops. The English pound, it drops. So a European can come to this country and, and have a bigger vacation, buy more than he could a year ago. But you go over there, you're going to pay more than you would have a year ago because your money doesn't buy as much. All right. So these are factors that are affecting people. Factors like that affect the way people vote. And they control, therefore, the polls. 
An issue that's brought to the forefront before the election happens is because that, there's a reason for that issue, see. And you wonder how much of this is manipulated. Who do they want in office? Who do they want to become the next president of this country? Why? What's behind this? What's going on? Let me talk about the CFR with you this morning for just a moment. The Council on Foreign Relations is an American institution. It was created in 1917, officially in 1918 for the purpose of creating a one world government. So don't let anybody kid you and don't let anybody spin it any other way. The CFR is about a one world government. It was started by Paul Warburg, J.P. Morgan, and Rockefeller. We're talking about some of the richest people in the world. And these people were globalists. They had a global agenda. Plain the words, a globalist is somebody who wants to bring the whole world under a, uh, under a one world government. Now, they may be, it may be benign. Their attitude may be, well, this is the only way man can live. You know, it may not be devilish in that sense. Uh, you don't, I'm not in here to question anybody's motives, but I'm telling you what's going on. And that is that they want a one world government. Now, that ought to interest you. Because Revelation 13 says that this Antichrist is going to rule the world. Amen. That should be of interest to you. You should say to yourself, well, now, if there's somebody who's actively in, involved in bringing about a one world government, I need to be watching that. Yes, you do. Because the average American's only interested in his entertainment, his comfort, his six-pack, his pocketbook. That's all he's interested in. Just like a herd, as long as the herd gets, as long as the herd's well fed, the herd's put to bed at night, the herd, and, and take care of the herd, the herd's okay. And the shame of it is that the elite see the people of this country as nothing more than a herd. And they spoon feed people with a certain amount of information that they want them to have. And that's it as far as it goes. And you wonder, you wonder, who makes the choices long before they ever become public as to who the presidential candidates will be? It's an amazing thing at how the, the, the popularity shifts. And I, I'm sure if you've read anything, you should be aware of the momentum today. You should, be, uh, it should, you should know. You should know that Tuesday in Ohio and Texas is going to be a primary. And if, uh, if, if, if Mrs. Clinton does not gain the support that she needs, she's counting on the support from Ohio and, and Texas. doesn't get it, she's out. And so that means that uh, Barack Obama and uh, it appears to be John McCain, unless there's a deadlocked convention with the Republicans, and this is what Huckabee intends to do. He's trying to have a deadlocked convention in the Republican convention so that when they have the convention, they'll broker a candidate, which, I mean, he may be shooting as wild as he can in trying to do that, but it appears like McCain is going to be the Republican nominee. So it appears right now like John McCain and Barack Obama the senator from Arizona and the senator from uh, Illinois, will face off in the general election in November. Okay? And this is, what, this is what's coming here in this country. Now, the CFR, the Council on Foreign Relations, is a globalist organization that is neither Democrat or Republican. Forget that. Get that out of your mind now. That is meaningless. That is irrelevant. Doesn't mean a thing to these people. These people are interested in one thing, and that is a global agenda. In the early 60s, a professor from Georgetown University, his name was Carol Quigley, a member of the CFR, was allowed an exclusive access for two years to their, to their information, to their archives, to what was going on with the CFR. Here's what he said after two years. He said... These men are about to create a one-world system of financial control in private hands, able to dominate political systems of each country and the economy of the world as a whole. That's a mouthful. Carol Quigley said that they intend to create a one-world system or a world system of financial control in private hands, able to dominate political systems, many differs a Democrat or Republican, of each country and the economy of the world as a whole. That's what he said, Professor at Georgetown. Now, either he's a loon or, or uh, he told the truth. 
That's what he found. And therefore, in short, they seek total and quiet control of the entire world. And notice how they're doing it. Remember what he said. I forget who said it, but he's what he said. He said, I don't care who your army is and who your president is or your parliament or your king or your queen. If I control the money, I control the world. You don't have to know who it is. It doesn't make any difference. You don't need to vote about it. Just like this uh, North American Union that's uh, happening right now in a shadow government. NAFTA is the, is the beginning, the prelude to it. It costs 200,000 jobs in Ohio. How many does it cost in Tennessee? How many does it cost in Michigan, for example, Detroit? The, uh, you know, the basis of uh, the automotive industry. How many jobs has NAFTA cost this country? Well, Hillary Clinton's husband, Bill Clinton, signed it into law. And, and listen, please don't think for a minute I'm supporting any political candidate. I'm just giving you the facts. At the beginning, she supported it. But in this campaign, when she has seen how people have turned on, they're blaming NAFTA, and rightfully so, she's distancing herself from NAFTA. Okay? Well, remember what Ross Perot said. He was a businessman. He said, NAFTA will take your jobs south. Well, mark this down. That's, that's a, that's, that's a plaything compared to what this North American Union is going to do. Because they have already got the ports in Mexico. The, they're going to build a superhighway up through Mexico, through the United States, into Canada. The customs entrance will be in Mexico, not the U.S., no longer a sovereign U.S. border. We will no longer be a sovereign country that says, you can't bring that into our country. It comes in through Mexico because we have a North American Union, and these goods are going to be flowing up to the north. Where are they coming from? They're coming from China. They're coming from other places in the country, other pl I mean in the world. What we have here is a global economy being created and controlled by globalists right under our very nose. It appears to be that the economy seems to be the first and foremost uh, focus of their efforts, the economy. The second focus of their efforts will be political sovereignty, because if they can get the economy like the North American Union, they get the political sovereignty. The third focus will be religion. Because the religion's not quite as important to them right now as the other two are. But the day will come when the whole world will worship one God. And he'll be walking on two legs. They'll be looking at a man and calling him God. And we'll give you a little bit about the religion here in a minute. Because there's certainly work in the area of religion. But what's important right now is that what's the first thing you do to a man to get his attention? His pocketbook. Get his pocketbook. You got his attention. When Friday rolls around, your paycheck says, uh, you cannot cash this check until you have done this, that, this, that, this, that, this, that. It's going to get your attention real fast. Real fast. Or you can no longer cash this check until you receive a little chip here. And once you have the chip, scan it, we know it's you, then you can cash your check. Nine out of ten people in the country will take the chip. And think about it, you know, I mean, after all, it's a good thing. It's uh, profitable and it's convenient and, and comfortable and peace, prosperity, and the coming Holocaust. That's what Dave Hunt's book said about 20 years ago. And he knew exactly what he was talking about, okay? So the CFR, Carol Quigley said, had that intent that they would quietly have total control over the entire world. These people have aspirations, folks. <laughs> I mean, they don't, they're not playing games. The CFR members include the American wealthiest tycoons, highly placed established media, tax-exempt foundations, government, education. A man by the name of Richard Harwood wrote, the ruling class journalist said, CFR membership, the ruling establishment in the USA. The Washington Post article boasted, They do not merely analyze and interpret foreign policy for the U.S. They help make it. Who are we talking about? We're talking about the people you see on TV every night. The faces that speak from NBC, CBS, ABC, CNN, Fox, and the rest of them. These people are the ruling media elite. 
I mean, after all, if you start out as a local news reporter and you wind up on CBS, you feel like you've made it, right? If you're on the evening news or you're out there, that's where they get their reporters from. They get them from the station, the local stations. You've risen and you've, uh, you've, you've arrived. These policymakers, therefore, are the elite media who have, a con who have a direct connection with what's going on. You know them. In 1995, Michael Eisner of Disney and Thomas Murphy of ABC merged. It became a huge corporation. ABC is a news organization. You're all aware of the American Broadcasting Company. Michael Eisner is the CEO of Disney. Look at what Disney controls. These two merged and created a huge corporation that became a CFR corporate member. In the year 2000, America Online, the largest Internet provider in the country, and Time Warner, one of the world's largest news organizations, merged. CEO Tom Johnson, CNN, CEO of Gerald Levine, both CFR members. Sounds like the CFR is beginning to control the media in this country, doesn't it? That's what they intend to do. Media giants now have been, have been, uh, have been uh, created. So a handful of elitists in this country are controlling what you hear, what you see, the entertainment for your children. I don't know if you've noticed it lately or not, but the cartoons are not cartoons anymore. They're all political. They're all social. And they've got an agenda. They're creating one world religion kids. Now, uh, one of the brothers in the church I'm indebted to for this little article, The Risky Business of Islamic Finance. Now, you know that money's leaving our country, don't you? I mean, who are you paying this money to to buy all this gasoline? See? All right. A lot of money's flowing out of America. Okay. That's what's called a deficit in trade. See, it's all going over there, but it's not coming over here. All right. But it is coming over here. You see, you buy a lot of your oil from Arab countries. These Arab countries are Islamic countries. Uh, Islamic country that is tied to the Arab law of Sharia is a country that lives in the Dark Ages. But they are tied to the law of Sharia. The Sharia law trumps any other law to a real Muslim. Just like I told you that the head of the Church of England... The Archbishop, he's not the head, I keep saying that. Archbishop of Canterbury is the second uh, uh, in, in order. The Queen's the head of the Church of England. Just like Henry VIII started it, the Queen's the head of it. But the Archbishop of Canterbury is the highest religious figure in the Church of England. Said a few weeks ago, he said, well, maybe there should be some instances here in England where Sharia law should trump English law. Uh, boy, he got some backlash on that. He really did. I mean, the people rose up against him, thank God. And, uh, I mean, you understand, don't you, that the, the basis of the freedom of the United States of America is based upon the law of England of four or 500 years ago. And I'm talking about a free and open society, free people. And it, uh, this is what the, the, the foundation of the laws of this country. And uh, so the, he said it was going to trump. No, it didn't. They, they, they kicked at it. But here's the problem. If the Muslims loan the money back to you that you gave to them when you bought a gallon of their gasoline, which is overpriced, you're paying them to, to loan you money, all right? Sharia law says this, you cannot charge interest on the money. Now, some of the biggest banks in this country are clamoring for that money. Why? Because they're falling on hard times. All these bad loans, these bad loans, investments in real estate and so forth, going belly up, bad loans. So what are you going to do? You're losing this money. And these banks have investors, and the bottom line with an investor is one thing, profit. So they're losing money. So Islam says, we'll loan you the money, but you can't charge interest, but you can use it for pay your CEO's wages, and you can use it for this and that and so forth and so on. And when they want it, they want it. I mean, they that means they can channel money somewhere else. But it's got some strings attached to it. The strings attached. You know what it is? You have to invest so much money out of this money into Islamic charities. State Department's already done some research into some of these Islamic charities, and they are supporting terrorism. It's kind of a catch-22 thing, isn't it? 
I mean, I'm a CEO of a big bank, and I've got, uh, I'm starting to get some bad debts, and I need some money. And, and, and so, you know what they've done? They've created an index on Wall Street that's Islamic charities, and they're pouncing on this money like you wouldn't believe. It's an amazing thing, isn't it? I wonder when the feds will get into this and start nosing around and find out what's going on. You know what they've done? They're controlling your money. They're controlling the money that's in your pocket. They're controlling what you buy and what you sell. It's already happening. Amen. Sharia law. Barrett Kios on her website, Crossroads, has an excellent article about the CFR. You remember that the CFR is a globalist organization, one world government, all right? And they've already said they're going to deal with the political, economic, and religious issues. The CFR is as clearly globalist as it can be. One world. You'd have to live in a cave in the dark ages not to know that. I mean, I know that I'm wearing that point out, but the reason I am is because of America's pastor, who is a member of the CFR. And who is that? Rick Warren explained that he'd also counseled with the National Security Council in the White House when he took his trip to Syria as well as the State Department. In fact, Warren added, when he was dealing with, uh, when he was corresponding with a, with, a, with a journalist here who publishes the World Net Daily, these are the words of Rick Warren, quote, As a member of the Council on Foreign Relations and Oxford Analytica, I might know as much about the Middle East as you. He said that because the journalist here who publishes the World Net Daily had criticized him for going to Syria and Syria used him as a propaganda tool to make it look like Syria has this great freedom of religion, which they do not have. But anyway, in response to that criticism, Rick Warren responded to this journalist who publishes the World Net Daily. I wish I could think of his name. I don't have it written down here. Anybody, remember his, anybody in here know his name? Anyway, it's not important. He responded to that criticism by saying, I'm a member of the CFR, which gave me credentials to travel to Syria. And I may know as much, implying I know more than you do about the Middle East problem. All right. Now, Mr. Warren, are you a member of the CFR? You said it with your own mouth. You are a member of the CFR. That would be like me getting up and saying to you, I'm a member of the local coven over here, and we meet at Halloween night, and we offer blood sacrifice to the devil. And yet I'm up here in the pulpit preaching as a Christian pastor. They're opposed to each other. They can't be the same. But there's a reason for this. Because the CFR wants Rick Warren. Why do they want him? They want him because he has enormous influence. Knoxville, Tennessee has clone after clone yep, after yep. clone after clone pastor standing in the pulpit. That's a, that's a Rick Warren clone. Right. Amen. He reads his book. He goes to his seminars. That's what he's about. Whatever Rick Warren says, that's what they do. The churches are fashioned after that church. Whatever happened to the little old country church right. that just got out there and had prayer meetings and yep. prayed and yep. preached and ministered to their people in their community... And the, only, and the only contact they had with other churches occasionally was when they might have had a big revival or something, camp meeting got together. But apart from that, they didn't have a clue what was going on 3,000 miles down the road. Right. Didn't need to know because each church is an autonomous, independent yep. organization. Amen. Amen. Ought to be. That's right. not, not, not anymore. Not anymore. It's what works. What works? How are we going to build us a mega church? What does it take to fill it up with numbers, build bigger buildings so we can put more people in it, so we can build bigger buildings to put more people in it, so we can minister to people, so we can get them in church, so we can build more buildings to get more people in church, to build more buildings to get more people in church, so when we've got more people in church, we can build more buildings to get more people in church. We just keep building and filling and building and filling and building right, and filling. Right. So what's it about? Well, you've got the same divorce rate you've always had, same fornication, drinking, same lying, stealing, yep. same old garbage going on. I mean, nothing's really happened. You're just religious now. Whatever happened to be born again? That message is gone. Listen to this. 
Quote, a sea of change, of transitions and transformations is birthing a whole new world, unquote, wrote Dr. Leonard Sweet, whose books are often quoted in Rick Warren's ministry toolbox. Quote again, God is birthing the greatest spiritual awakening in the history of the church, unquote. I need to go see that, brother. Let's load up a bus and go find what he's talking about. Because I haven't seen it. If you love truth, you may want to say no. This is Barrett Kill speaking now. If you, if you love truth, you may want to say no. For in his book, Soul Tsunami, Dr. Sweet, a popular leader of the emerging church, and we'll talk about that later, not today, but right. talk about what that's a, that's a catchphrase there. That's a, the emerging church tells us to flow with the currents of change and leave God's unchanging gospel behind. <laughs> Quote, postmodern culture, that's where we are right now. Right is a change or be changed world, unquote, he continues. Quote, reinvent yourself for the 21st century or die. Some would rather die than change, unquote. That's me. Yep. Amen. Amen. Would Rick Warren agree? Probably since he wrote this glowing endorsement for the front cover of Sweet's book, Soul Tsunami shows us why these are the greatest days for evangelism since the first century. What kind of evangelism does Warren envision? Would it be based on God's Word or on good, good works? Apparently the latter. In a world that has traded biblical absolutes for changing values and feel-good experiences, God's divisive truths face a rising tide of hostility. But few will argue against helping the poor and the sick. Of course not. Perhaps that's why Pastor Warren keeps repeating this statement, quote, the first Reformation was about belief. This one's going to be about behavior. Unquote. In plainer words, the focus is no longer on truth, absolute truth and doctrine, who you are and who Christ and who God is, but it's about what are we doing? Right. Yep. You change the focus, you've changed the whole meaning of all of it. The new focus is on unity. Here we go. Yeah. CFR. CFR. The new focus is on unity, a worldwide oneness. Reflected in the growing union between the East and the West. Eastern people don't think the same way as Western people. That doesn't make them any better or us any better or any different in that sense. They just don't think the same. People are different. I mean, after all, is not America a cultural melting pot? Don't we bring into this country the differences of the people? Don't they say that we should celebrate the differences of people? But you say it and somebody says, well, you're a bigot and a racist. No. Everybody's not the same. Amen. That doesn't make one any better than the other. Amen. But they don't think the same. But anyway, the new focus on unity. Worldwide one is reflected in the growing union between the East and the West. Leonard Sweet's online book, Quantum Spirituality, sheds some revealing light of the envisioned global church for the 21st century. In his view, the offense of the cross has been replaced with a passion for interfaith peace. Right. Now, that's a big word, interfaith peace. What's that mean? That means that a Buddhist, Confucius, Mohammedan, a Janis, uh, uh, a Christian, and uh, Sufism, or, uh, or the Kabbalah, or anything else, you just mix them all together and find a common ground. A common ground. Common ground. We've about run out of time, so I'll finish reading this and we'll close it up. For an interfaith peace, and possibility thinking. Norman Vincent Peale is the daddy, great granddaddy yep, yep. of possibility thinking, and right. Robert Schuller is the one who got it out across the TV. Yep. And, and, and uh, Rick Warren is a disciple of Robert Schuller. Yep. Right. And so we'll pick this up again next week because we've run out of time, and I don't want to run over give you a little time. We've covered a lot of stuff in here this morning. I'll give you a little time to digest some of it, think over it, and we'll pick it up again next week. And of all the things that I've given you this morning, the most remarkable to me, I lived 60-something years, had never heard John Fitzgerald Kennedy's speech about the conspiracy. Never heard it. Never heard it in my life. Did not know it existed. It's amazing how the media buried that. Yeah. They buried it. Brother Crane dismisses.